Welcome very, very much to Conversations. We're pleased to welcome to Conversations Daniel Singer, the writer for the Nation magazine, stationed for the most part in Europe. And uh, Daniel Singer, welcome once again to Conversations. Oh, I'm very pleased to be with you here. Yeah, we spoke with you last year at the uh, Socialist Scholars Convention, where we are again this year, 1991. Last year, of course, we were all focusing on events in Europe. There were these tremendous uh, developments in Europe. Uh, of course, this year, events in Iraq, the Persian Gulf, and so forth. I wonder if maybe you could give us a little bit of your, your, sense, your sense of the European reaction that might be different than what you may have perceived the American reaction on the part of the American citizenry was to events in the Persian Gulf. I think there was a difference in reaction to begin with, and less so afterwards. But to understand and to grasp it well, I think one should look back on our conversation a year ago. When we were here a year ago, and we talked together, uh, obviously everything was focused on Europe, because Europe had just gone in 1989 through an extraordinary upheaval, which was the end of, a, of the Cold War, the end of a period, uh, of the Yalta period, mm. the end of an era, if you want, with the collapse of the Soviet Empire, the liberation of various European countries and the transformation of their regimes. We don't know yet where it will all lead to, but there was this great sense of historical change. And that obviously affected, in some ways, relations between Europe and the United States, or potentially affected the relations between Europe and the United States. What did one talk, let's say, before August, before the Middle Eastern crisis? Mm -hmm. One was talking about the fact that with the end of the Warsaw Pact, is there a need uh, for, for a NATO? With the end of the Cold War and, quote unquote, the Russian threat, should one still have American troops in Europe? Mm. Should one have an arms industry as important as it was? Or should one have, for instance, a military alliance dominated by the United States? Mm. As combined with the fact that you had an economic shift going on for some time, from the, uh, to the advantage of Europe and Japan in relation to the United States, people began to think for the first time, I think seriously, about Europe, Western Europe, uh, becoming a real rival and competitor mm -hmm. uh, to the United States. This was due particularly to the fact that we had, that's the other event that occurred before, before the Persian Gulf crisis, the reunification of Germany. Right. And Germany for the first time appearing as the potential federator of this Western Europe, because if one looks historically throughout the post-war period at the events, uh, who could have made a federation of Europe? When I say a European unity, like you had at one stage German unity, mm -hmm. and it was Prussia, mm -hmm. which united that German Solferein into it, 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 Germany, yeah. who could make Western Europe? Uh, really a federation, one unit, one state in the long run. You yeah, see? the, the uh, engine that will pull it along. That's right. Sense, now, yeah. at some stage, people were saying possibly the United States to begin with, but the United States noticed very quickly that if Europe is united, it will be too much of a competitor and a rival. Then you had General de Gaulle, who had the, the stature and the gestures, but who didn't have the means and the power to do so. Mm -hmm. And so the only country which looked seriously as a possible unifier or federator was Germany. But as long as Germany was the was divided. And as long as Germany accepted that division and accepted the fact that it was dependent on the American nuclear weapons for its defense, obviously it could not be the leader of an independent coalition standing up to the United States. So all that I'm bringing, I'm yeah. not avoiding your question no, I understand at all. Exactly. You're I'm trying to say that here we had a situation in which from an American point of view, when I say American, I don't mean the American people, but I mean the American government and uh. the American establishment. Here there was something that was quite risky, dicey, difficult, and so on. Mm -hmm. And suddenly here came Saddam Hussein. If he yeah. didn't exist, he should have been invented. Oh. Because in some way, take all these questions that I've raised, yeah. he's answering them all in some way. You, need, you may not need NATO as such, but you still need some sort of military force to react to dangers in the Middle East. You obviously need weapons and more ad most advanced weapons. Mm. You obviously need an alliance and the leader of that alliance should be the United States. Mm. Now all that was partly to answer your question because what happened that at that stage you had a difference between the European countries, the West European countries and the United States in their reaction to the Gulf crisis because for the United States it was obvious that this, this crisis was giving them potential answers 
to all the difficulties, the political difficulties that were appearing on the international horizon. Mm -hmm. It was not at all clear in the same way for the European countries. And therefore, up to the up to mid-January, let's say, up to the actual outbreak of the war, you had a difference in emphasis, at least, and in attitudes between the European governments and the United States. I would make an exception here for Britain, and to some extent Holland. The Dutch and the British were completely aligned on the United States from the beginning. Interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. But on the other countries were appearing at least on the face of it, seem to have a different policy. And the example, I live in Paris, and the example of Mitterrand in France is a good example here, because looking at what he declared until the 15th of January, he had a different policy, and he was saying publicly, and he had some backing in Europe. He was saying publicly, there are two, two points in which I differ from the United States. One is that we think that there should be an international conference, Mm -hmm. an international conference that would be dealing with the Middle Eastern question, including the Palestinian national problem. Yes, right. All right, that was one thing. And the second thing where he seemed to differ from the United States was to say, we are for the evacuation, for the United Nations policy of evacuating Kuwait by the Iraqis, but not at all for an attack on Iraq. You yeah. see. Now, if you think of it, these were only gestures. Because if you go to the heart of the matter, there wasn't so much difference. Or there wasn't as much difference as, as it would appear, as long as the European countries were not willing to veto American policy. Which they were not. Which no, they were no, not. No, you no, see? And right. that's which appeared progressively. Because you could see here it appeared as a great difference between the two. And with that great difference, you see, you could have, you could have said there will be a clash. But they were never saying to the Americans, if you don't do that, then we're not backing you. If you do that, uh, if you don't do that, we'll veto you. There and might have been a time when they might have, or there might have been a discord, they, they or there were, might there have been a difference of opinion. If there was, there was even, yeah, there in was historical even, context. Uh, you yeah. see, there was it, and I'll give you an example. There wasn't that. You see, so therefore, you had this appearance of a difference, but because it was not backed by policy, it was not a real difference. And the proof of that, and that answers what you've just mentioned was later in the conflict, when after the 15th of January, Europe completely aligned itself, including the French. Mm. And when Gorbachev made his proposals, which were, which were disturbing to the Americans because they could have ended the conflict before the, when they made, before the land offensive and before the Americans wanted to, let, to, to end it, you had the Germans who approved the Gorbachev proposal, the Spaniards who approved the Gorbachev proposal, the Italian parliament which approved the Gorbachev proposal, and here was Mitterrand who had a, this was, the, the, the Gorbachev proposals were less than what Mitterrand was asking on the 15th of January. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And therefore, he could have then taken a position vis-a-vis -vis the United States and say, look, I'm here the representative of Europe, and we're disagreeing with you. But, but he didn't. Not. He did not. Why? That, what, 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 do you why? Think? Because, what does it mean? Because I think that there was a general acceptance, fundamentally, of the idea that our interests are common. Whose side are you on? Fundamentally, finally, whatever the differences of emphasis, that vis-a-vis -vis the danger that might appear in the Middle East, we're in the same camp. In other words, there was a long period when socialists in Europe were saying that there is only one possibility, I, uh, uh, one alternative. Either you have the United Socialist States of Europe or you have the Europe of the United States. Now, that was disappeared as an idea for the very simple reason that the socialist Europe is very distant on the horizon and you can't see the perspective of it, you see. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And therefore, we, we, we began to think maybe without even a socialist transformation, you may have a Europe which unites and which has a policy different from the United States. Now, I draw the conclusion from the events now that unless you have the idea of a radically different society, you are not capable of standing, the European countries are not capable of standing up to the United States. In other words, they were aligned on the United States because they do not have the vision of a different society. And that actually the gap that existed between European society and American society is much smaller now than it was 30 years ago. There have been some people who have observed this might be the first united first world war against third world in a certain sense, or an alignment of north-south 
rather than east-west in terms of geopolitical uh, you, you're, realities. You're, you're, I mean. you're in fact providing the answer to the question that you put yourself earlier. That mm -hmm. is to say, in, rel in the conflict between the advanced capitalist countries of, of the Western world and the Third World, there was more of an alliance between Europe and the United States than, than of division. There were different interests, and there were different interests which you could see even during the period of apparent coalition. Because let us say, for instance, when the United States were take, bringing down the bank rate, and Germany was bringing its bank rate up, mm. you could see that there was a contradiction. Obviously, mm. this, this, and, and these economic interests and these economic conflicts will continue. But my sort of immediate conclusion would be that for the short historical period, in the long run, as Keynes said, in the long run we're all dead, mm. you see, but, yeah. but in, the, in the short run, I think the United States have succeeded in reasserting provisionally uh, the dominating position within the Western alliance, whether it will last, whether the, the economic contradictions, the growth and the development of, of, of Western Europe and Japan will in the long run change this balance, that nobody can tell because it's history. But I think in the, if we look at the immediate future, I think the Americans have, thanks to Saddam Hussein, thanks to that conflict, hmm. reasserted their dominating position within the Western alliance. And really the only novelty in that case during that period was obviously the disappearance of the Soviet Union as the other superpower. You Which see many that would have made all the difference in the world historically as we think of these events of completely. In, the, in the Persian Gulf or in the broader third world area. Completely, yeah. you see, because many people have said this is the reaffirmation or the reassertion of the United Nations and of the role that they used to play beforehand. But that's not quite accurate, no? you see. What really has happened? You may remember that when the United Nations, I mean, some of you who are young, I mean, this is, you've learned it in history books, uh, but, uh, but when the United Nations were founded, the idea was that you'll have the five permanent members, the five policemen, of whom two were the, if you want, the super gendarme, the yeah. super policemen, and who were the two powers which were to become the two nuclear powers. Now, the assumption then was, quite rightly, that if these two superpowers agree on something, representatives of the two main blocks, because you had the non-aligned countries in the two blocks, obviously they can impose it mm. on the rest of the world. But that didn't work for the very simple reason that they did not agree. And for that reason, the United Nations didn't function. The only time that the Security Council could manage to do a thing was during the Korean War, and this was because of a misunderstanding, because the, the Russians miscalculated and they, they walked out, and you never should walk out of a, mm. of a body. But in any, case, true, in, yeah. in any case, that was a misunderstanding. What is new is not that there is agreement between the two, but that one of the two superpowers has ceased to be the superpower. And when, when, when the Americans are now talking about, uh, you know, the new world order or something like that, it's not a new order, it's, it's, it's as, uh, if you want, it's as modern as, uh, as a missile and as old as capitalism itself. Yeah, or but imperial, it's, or capitalist imperialism. That's right. Yeah. But, but it's an order that, w the, 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 an attempt to spread capitalism now to the planet at large mm -hmm. and take advantage of the fact of the Soviet surrender uh, to make it into a complete world system. Now, that doesn't mean that it's going to be successful. Uh, we're entering a new period when you will have conflicts between North and South, conflicts within, uh, within areas, conflicts which will reappear between the three, three great advanced blocks. blocks of the United States. Uh, Western Europe, China. Western Europe, probably dominated by Germany and Japan. Yeah. Uh, uh, what is happening in the Soviet area we now see is only the beginning of a big transformation of which we do not know the conclusion at all. Uh, uh, we, we can see, looking at, at East Germany, for instance, and, and Poland to a certain extent, that these people who have re rejected not only really existing socialism, that is to say the regime that they had in the country, but to some extent the idea of socialism and the dream of socialism are suddenly discovering really existing capitalism mm. with its drawbacks, with its unemployment, with uh, its big social differences and so on. And we don't yet know what will emerge from that 
great upheaval which is only beginning. Is that beginning to happen? I mean, among the people that have uh, had I these dreams, are you yes, beginning you, 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 to you see have some, uh, you have disillusionment? Already, uh, you, already, you certainly have already the disillusionment of which you have two examples. One is obviously East Germany where you begin to have marches like in Leipzig. I mean, marches probably not as big as they were those which preceded the downfall of the regime in 1989. But there is already the discontent, an understandable discontent, because if you include short-time working among the unemployed, and short-time working is really unemployment almost in Eastern Germany, quite soon one expects maybe half of the population could, of the working population could be unemployed. Or you had an ex another example that was in Poland when you had the elections not so long ago, and during, during that election it's true that uh, Lech Wałęsa was elected president on the second ballot, but in the first ballot, let's say, the prime minister, who was a man of solidarity, was completely rejected. And the man who was a complete unknown, Stan Timinski, is somebody who, Paul, who came back from Canada, who was like if he escaped from a soap opera, you see, for the Poles, the local boy who did well in the United States, oh, not, it, it was in Canada, but in America, who did uh -huh. it, came back and, and received 25% of the vote, a vote that was a vote of discontent, quite obviously. You see, a man from nowhere. Uh -huh. uh, so you have, I'm not saying that you have a revival of socialism or, or of the socialist idea in these countries. It will take a very long time for the people in these countries to make a difference between Stalinism, really existing socialism, all that existed, and for them was quite obviously something unpalatable. And uh, what will happen uh, later on, I mean, uh, to make a difference between that and socialism as we have conceived it in, as, demo as a democratic socialism for a long time. I think it will take time and it will take a period of uh, the discovery of the disadvantage. You see, they had an idealization which is quite understandable. Mm -hmm. When you are displeased with what you're living through, you look you idealize the past, the other, yeah. you idealize mm. uh, the other world, and mm. for all sorts of val valid reasons. When Mr. Yeltsin came to this country, as he writes in his autobiography, he saw the supermarket and he, un you know, and he saw the light, you mm. see. I mean, you know, he, mm. he, he, he was overwhelmed. Now, all right, and it's quite impressive for, for people from Eastern Europe, but then they progressively they discover, A, that what they are being offered now, it's not a choice between, let's say, Sweden, uh, social democratic Sweden and Thatcherite Britain or post-Thatcherite Britain, but that the choice they are offered is probably between Mexico and, 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 and Bolivia yeah, or right, something okay, like that. Right, right, you right, see, so yeah. that's one of the things so that the, that's one of the things that they're, 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 they're discovering, but also they're discovering that this uh, market economy which was idealized uh, because of this success, which they were told that was horrible, then they discovered that it was good, then they, they thought it's marvelous, it's much better. I remember the first time I went back to Eastern Europe, uh, uh, the only thing that people were asking you was, how many months do you have to work to buy a car? And the only thing, because they had been told for so long that people lived badly in the West, that then they jumped to the other conclusion. Mm. And they concluded that everybody in the West lived like Rockefeller does, or something like that, you see. And one had to say, all right, yes, it's true that a car, you, 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 you have to work fewer months in for a car in Western Europe than in, than, than in Eastern Europe. But, you know, there is the problem of housing for us, and there are the social services, and how much you have to pay for it, and so on, and so on. But that wasn't something that they would buy. I understand that. Mm -hmm. It was a normal reaction to a long period of lies about the outside world. The, the world, the West was described as a nightmare, and suddenly it looked like a paradise, uh -huh, you see. Uh -huh. Now they're progressively discovering that certainly their thing was, was pretty bad, but what they're being offered now is not much better. Actually, they're discovering that all sorts of things are rather unpleasant. You had a curious reaction of these people. In one sense, as I said earlier, they rejected the very idea of socialism, and I'm saying not only really existing socialism, for the very simple reason, I mean, that it was identified for them, what they were told, this is socialism, if that's socialism, I mean, I want anything but that, yes, you see. Uh -huh. But at the same time, some of the principles which were completely betrayed and never put in, applied, they accepted them almost unconsciously into their, in, in, in their minds. What I want to say by that, 
When you talk now to technocrats in these countries, and the technocrats in these countries talk in exactly the same way as do the technocrats emerging from, from the, you know, Harvard uh, business school and applying for a job at, at the IMF, you see, uh, and they talk in exactly the same way. You know what they tell you when they're polite? They tell you, it's the terrible thing in our country. It's, it's, it's our population. Mm. The people are, as I say, when they're polite, they're saying the people are too egalitarian and too fond of social justice. <laughs> and when they're less polite, yeah. they say they're bums who don't want to work and so on and yeah, so yeah, on. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you have a curious mixture. I think the rejection of, of, of socialism because this is the dominating system which exploited us, which we don't like. And at the same time, an unconscious acceptance of some of the things which we do associate with socialism, that is to say, some forms of social justice, some form of the fact that you, that you shouldn't have too great ine inequalities between people and so on and so on. So what will emerge from that, we don't know. What we can say is that we're at the beginning of a long historical transition period in Eastern Europe. Yeah, in Eastern Europe and throughout the European yeah. and throughout the European area, this generally accepted notion of this being a first world united in a certain sense war against a third world uh, power, as it were, that there is a united first world against the third world is generally accepted. They see it this way. And I wonder, do you think that the United States having control over the oil resources that they do, military people on the ground, is this a move in order to bring some pressure to bear in terms of negotiating with Japan and Germany and possible differences between them? Is there likely to be a conflict developing over the fact that they are so dependent upon those Persian Gulf oil resources to run their economies? And could it lead to dissension among the united first world powers, as it were? Certainly that, you see, I wouldn't use the, when we say conflict, it certainly exists, but people may accept conflict here as a, as a real confrontation. I think there is a conflict all the time. And in this conflict, the United States did gain some advantages, the ones that you just described, namely, uh, that if you have, I mean, or two things, one that you've described and another that we've talked about earlier. Uh, the, the thing that you've described, that's the control over the sources of energy and therefore the price of energy. Mm -hmm. And that's extremely important. That gives an advantage to the United States in its economic competition Bargaining. and yeah. rivalry with the countries of Western Europe and of Japan, which are incidentally even more dependent on oil than are the United States. By all means, yeah. So that's one thing. But there is also the thing that I mentioned earlier, that is to say the reassertion of the need to deal with these problems of the third world, of, of, of the revolt possibly of these countries, that you need a military uh, power, and we are, the we, the United States, are that military power, or at least we should be the leader of that alliance, because we have the military superiority, the weapons, and so on and so on. That certainly is is a, a factor of American policy, but it's also an element of the dissension and conflicts that you're going to have between the countries belonging to the, fir the, the first world, as you, uh, as you described. But there was among the leadership of, the, of those, East, those European countries generally an acquiescence or an acceptance of that general premise, uh, the general premise of the massive use of military power, the President of the United States, the Chief Executive Officer, talking about the use of tactical nuclear weapons and this whole militaristic, what looked like age-old imperialistic use of, of a gunboat diplomacy, writ large missile diplomacy, was a general acceptance of that uh, status that they yes, took? Yes. And were there any widespread opposition to that, as there was some uh, opposition to it here within the United no, States? No, you had, you had an opposition, but that opposition was significantly an opposition that came from forces which were outside consensus politics. Uh, yeah. In other words, what you had, you had a peace movement and, or anti-war movement, if you want, but it consisted mainly of various uh, peace movement, uh, uh, various far-left parties, the old new left, if mm. you want, yeah. uh, uh, some communist parties, uh, and within the socialist parties, uh, the people who were rejecting the official line. You had it, for instance, in France with the resignation of the Minister of Defense, um, Jean-Pierre Chevènement, who was a member of the Socialist Party, but who was opposed and who resigned over that acceptance 
of the United States domination of uh, the Western world. And I think that what it really shows is uh, that whatever the balance at the present moment, that in Western Europe, uh, you have the beginning of a conflict between those who accept the idea that we must have a future, that our future is American, if you want. Mm -hmm. That the only way in which you can run the economy and society and so on is the same as the one in the United States. Mm -hmm. And those who reject at once uh, the neo-Stalinist system which existed and which is rejected in Eastern Europe, and the American uh, form of, of, of capitalism that prevails in this country, and who would like to organize something different in Western Europe. But I think that Europe will be able to stand up to the United States and oppose it only when it really comes back with the idea of a society which in various ways, in, in the way in which you in the forms of democracy that you have at all levels, on the shop floor, uh, at the local level, at the mm -hmm. national level, uh, you give that power flows from below and that people are becoming the masters of their own destiny. Uh -huh. If you can evolve a system like that, then people will stand up and they will stand up in favor mm -hmm. of that system opposing it. Otherwise, and that is a proof that we've just had in this crisis, is that if you oppose it with roughly the same policies, with roughly the same alternative, then you're not, Europe is not capable, at least in the immediate historical period, to stand up to the United States. We're th therefore, not only in Eastern Europe, but in Western Europe, we're at the beginning of a new historical phase. Tremendous challenges. Tremendous challenges. And well. difficulties. That always is, but it's mm. always better to respond to challenges than to have a passive uh, acceptance of things which are not very acceptable and I think a war in which I, I, I would talk about the treason of the intellectuals yes. that we've had during this period mm. and I was shocked during that time and that's true with some exceptions and some minorities which did it I am shocked by the fact that in Europe and not only in the United States the intellectuals did not uh, raised their voice more loudly against the massacre that was being perpetrated yeah. in our own name, yeah. that you didn't have enough of the of the Picassos who were painting their Guernicas yeah, yeah. when you had that, of the, of, of the people who would, like Bertrand Russell, have their, have their international tribunal, and, and of uh, people who, like uh, in France, uh, around Jean-Paul Sartre, were yeah, signing yeah. petitions and protesting, S especially that Nobody was asking people to take sides in this conflict. Nobody was saying back Saddam Hussein, or mm. if there some people were saying they were, they were fools, mm. you see, because mm. it was quite obvious that uh, Saddam Hussein was a butcher of Baghdad, and we were saying that years ago, mm. and that suddenly the media were discovering this fact unanimously, all at the same time when he attacked American interests. Two years earlier, uh, when, or, 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 or before, when he was bombing uh, uh, the Kurds with, with, with mm. chemical weapons. Everybody was saying that he was magnificent because he was the defender of Western civilization against Iran. Fundamentalism, yeah. And that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and then, then suddenly they discovered that. Now, the fact, what we asked people really, what people were asked to do, was to prevent if they could, and if they couldn't prevent, at least to condemn the massacre which was carried out in their name of we don't even know how many people, yeah. how many, nobody really knows. 100,000, 100,000, 100, as a minimum, 120, 150, 50, nobody yeah, even right, knows. Right. It's, it's not only incalculable, yeah. it's uncalculated. Yeah, and see? it was such a one-sided thing and it was so, uh, I mean, and that, uh, and, that, and that we accepted. And that we accepted it morally and in other terms is really very disquieting. Yeah. Very disquieting and I think that it, it, I think that people are beginning to awaken to that and because they now see that it doesn't bring about such splendid solutions as they were presented you see that mm -hmm. is to say because of what happens now with the Kurds of Shia the Muslims and so on they and with the revolts in Iraq which were not helping and so on people are beginning to realize that this lovely war or oh, what a lovely war I'm to, yeah, yeah, to yeah, recall yeah. we Nintendo, play Nintendo uh, uh, video uh, game war that's right, yeah. that's right. there was once a a very nice play which was put up in England by John Littlewood was called Oh, oh What a Lovely War. Yes, you see, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and so it turns out that wars are always dirty, mm. horrible, and that we did not have the guts and the nerve and the courage to stand up 
and make a protest. That's something which is quite disquiet. Yeah, and per perhaps more more to the point, it wasn't so nasty and dirty for us. It was uh, our, we had we suffered very little casualties, us by meaning the United States or the coalition forces, which makes it all the more dangerous. <laughs> because if we accept this notion of we can project upon the other, that's a very very dangerous prospect for the major powers of the world to just sort of internalize as uh, as appropriate. And express myself clearly enough. Obviously, what it meant. No, no, no. On our side, the losses were almost nil. I mean, mm -hmm, you see, mm -hmm. I mean, it's always terrible. I mean, I, I, any loss is one too many. But, yeah. but, but on our side, it was less than a, you know, uh, the car they accidents over the, the weekend City. or something like yeah, that. That's right. So therefore, obviously, it was acceptable. But on top of that, it was presented as a sort of clean, clinical uh, something that I suppose I'm not blaming the people. I'm blaming the media to some extent because the, once they started showing like it was the the turkey shoot i mean uh, yeah, the, right, right, uh, right, right, the very right. people started getting worried if you show to people people who are massacred if you show to people bodies that are dismembered or something like that it won't take them very long to see what a war is no. but we were not we were, we were shown oh, we, we had no empathy for the other as it were uh, wartime tends to do that to people there was very little empathy here in the united states for the suffering of the of the yes, but I think we did, I don't I don't think we were shown very much of that. Well, I we think weren't able to be seen much. Ramsey Clark went and came back with some videotape. And no, no, I say, but on the whole, if you if you watch the media, I mean, I wasn't in New York, but I mean, in Europe, I think the, we had CNN as yes, well. Yes, of course. You see yeah, CNN, right. The, yeah, we all uh, watch the same thing. Th probably, that's right. Yeah. So on the whole, it was not a war in which you did really see the suffering, even of the other side, except small occasion. I mean, exceptions like for instance the bombing of that shelter yes. you see and 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 that immediately immediately created a stir and therefore immediately you had the reporters on the spot who were saying this was a massacre and immediately many commentators appearing on television saying but no it was a military thing and this was not the shelter for civilians and so on so we had we were submitted to propaganda effective propaganda yeah. successful propaganda whether it's a lasting effect i don't know it depends on the people themselves who are beginning to realize now that this war was not exactly what was sold to them as the war. Yeah. We've got a lot to learn. If I may, so your reporting has helped uh, educate us as we've gone along. I really thank you very much for coming in, sharing with us uh, your perception, the way you saw it from Europe and the way it was seen and some of the implications of it. And I thank you really very, very much. It was really good to see you again this year. Thank you. And I would remind you again, it's been your pleasure, the perception of Daniel Singer, a uh, European writer for The Nation magazine. We're here at the Socialist Scholars Convention, 1991 in April. And uh, once again, Daniel Singer, thank you very, very much indeed. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. We'll be coming right back. Welcome, welcome very, very much to this segment of conversation. I'm pleased to welcome to the program and to New York uh, Ernst Mandel, and he's a Marxist scholar of great renown. He's at the uh, Open University, the Free University of, uh, Brussels. of Brussels, and he's visiting here at the uh, Socialist Scholars Convention. And Ernst Mandel, welcome very, very much to conversation. I wonder if you might, uh, this last year has been dominated uh, by the events in the Persian Gulf, and I wonder if you would give your general perspective of what that means as Persian far as Gulf. Uh, the Persian Gulf situation. What does it mean in terms of the longer term uh, development of the, uh, of the capitalist imperialist world? Or how did you read it, and how did your colleagues in uh, Brussels read those events? Uh, uh, in terms of the longer term meaning, in terms of the organization of this world society? Uh, the w imperialism's war in the Persian Gulf is, expresses the fact that there is only one superpower left today in the world, the United States of America, from a military point of view, mm, as a result of the objective decline of the Soviet Union's military, economic, and political power, and that American imperialism tries to use that situation 
that unique situation which will not last forever, but mm. which exists now, in order to modify the world situation in its favor in two key fields where that situation had evolved unfavorably for the US power elite in the last 15 years. In the first place, the relationship with the so-called third world countries. The war was an attempt to reestablish direct control over an important part of that third world and uh, to serve notice to other parts of that third world, especially in Latin America, mm. that the same thing would happen there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Second field where there had been a deterioration for from point of view of the United States was in its relationship, economic and especially financial relationships, with the other imperialist powers. In the first place, Japan and West Germany. One knows that, uh, everybody knows, that Japan is now the predominant financial power in the world. If I'm not mistaken, eight of the ten biggest banks in the world are Japanese banks. That's true. One should know that in the industrial field and in the field of exports, West Germany, which has population which is only one quarter of the population of the United States, has equal or higher exports than the United States, which means that the per capita exports are three to four times bigger than those of the United States. In, yeah, okay. Interesting. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. So the use of military supremacy to modify these relationships has no start. I would make an additional remark saying that in the first field, unfortunately, unfortunately, imperialism, American imperialism has had a big success and one does not see with the possible exception of Brazil and even that is not clear which third world country is capable of standing up to the United States in the immediate future. Yeah, right. In the yeah. second field, things are more complicated. There, I think President Bush and whoever advises him is playing with fire. Because given the technological advance of Japan and given the technological potential of Germany, if the United States put too much pressure on these countries, they might answer by rearming themselves. Yes, indeed. Include, included on the field of nuclear weapons. They could, the history of the 30s shows us that countries which have such an industrial power uh -huh. can rearm, I would say, within three years' time. Well, Japan already has a considerable military yeah, power. Yeah, but it's something nowhere something comparable to, to that of the United oh, States. Oh, no, 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 no. no. But, but Britain, it could, but it Britain, could, yeah. it could, right. it could, it yeah. could achieve that. And its attitude is... And Western, uh, uh, don't push us too hard, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, their yeah. attitude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't push us too hard. Right, right. And in Western Europe, we will see the same thing. Don't right. push us too hard. Right. So there, I think America has to be more cautious. Finally, I want to add, as a convinced socialist, uh, a comment to that. I want to say that if this power politics can be analyzed in a more or less, let us say, academic way, yeah, yeah. what you can't do is close your eyes before the human misery, yeah, which is flowing from that. I have no sympathy whatsoever for Saddam Hussein. He's a tyrant, cruel tyrant, has committed huge crimes against humanity, but I have great sympathy for the Iraqi people mm -hmm. and the civilian 
population of Iraq has paid and is continuing to paying terrible price for that. Terrible. Terrible, terrible price. Yeah. Probably somewhere between 150,000 and 200,000 people died. Children were infected, will stay infected indefinitely. Water was poisoned. Mm -hmm. The danger of having nuclear power stations explode was courted. The same thing goes for the imposition of imperialist policies on other third world countries which are paid today by an unbelievable, an unbelievable degree of misery uh, in these countries. Each year in the third world 17 million children die from hunger and curable diseases. Uh, this is in uh, four years time uh -huh. the same number as deaths in the whole second world war. Yes, Auschwitz and Hiroshima yeah, come yeah. every four mm -hmm. years a world mm -hmm. war against children. For one of a vaccine so or some that, such that a is, thing that, as a nickel. That, yeah. that, is, that is what yeah, you, what yeah, you yeah. pay for. Yeah, yeah. And even in the western countries, the s richer countries of the world, the level of poverty and destitution increases all the time. Mm. We have now 40 million unemployed in the Western countries, this, will, this figure will become 50 million or more than 50 million in the course of this recession. So this is a terrible price you pay yeah. for this new world order. Yeah, 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 such as it is. And that we could be so callous about that, uh, the deaths that were caused. Exactly. Uh, the bombing of civilian infrastructure, the deliberate bombing of these things, constitutes what in many people's mind does constitute within the context with which it was carried out war crimes on I the would part of the so. United States. I would, be tribunal or the I would, I would say, I, I, I heard that, that the effect, right? initiative has been taken by former um, U.S. Secretary uh, of Justice, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Ramsey Clark. Yes, indeed, yes. Uh, he was on our program last yeah, week. And uh, I, I believe that that will become an international initiative with great echo, great echo throughout uh, Western Europe, Japan, and uh, several important third world countries like uh, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, uh, and so on. India, probably. So I think, uh, at least from a moral point of view, the rulers of the United States should pay a price for what they did. Yeah, they're, they're, not, they're not so inclined now, nor are the American people. And don't you think that it is uh, particularly um, disquieting that there were so few? It wasn't a war, it was a slaughter or a turkey shoot or high yes. technology directed against defense people who were totally defenseless against the onslaught of western yes. technology yes, that there were so few american or so-called coalition casualties as it were is going to uh, and, and there's this great xenophobic flag raving celebration celebrating the killing of so many uh, 150,000 human beings with no thought or empathy to the other side as it were even the civilian people it, it, it's morally very very damaging as far as the United States is concerned and that this might very well be done again it was done in Panama it's been done now again in, 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 in a large scale in, in Iraq and it could be done again, and as you said, serve notice on any other country in the world who might try to stand up to the first yes. world or American-led But here I hegemony. would be a little bit more optimistic, uh, or less pessimistic. It is true that the fact that there were very, very few casualties uh, on behalf of the coalition, camp of the coalition, has made it easier to hide the human costs of that war on the other side and make it accept by a majority of people in the United States, in Western Europe, in Japan, other parts of the world. But one of the reasons why that is so is the fact that the information about what has happened inside Iraq for the civilian population, what has happened inside Kuwait mm. with the majority of the population, I don't say the Kuwaiti, but the population amongst especially the Palestinians, what is happening in Turkey, 
uh, what is happening in this whole zone, what is happening in Saudi Arabia, that that information has not been gathered, centralized, spread by the media in any satisfactory way. And one of the main purposes of such a tribunal as the one which Mr. Ramsey Clark proposes to start is to bring to the American people, which has a tradition, and a great tradition, in a certain sense greater than most of the European countries, with yeah. the exception probably of France, of attachment to human rights, yeah. to the ideals of human rights, to bring that information and shock the people out of their apathy and out of their indifference and out of their callousness just by informing them what's going on, uh -huh. informing them. And I think that that is not impossible. It's difficult because everybody knows who controls the media and that you can't, you can't easily break through uh, the stranglehold of those who are more or less linked to the establishment. But is a famous sentence, uh, uh, the first victim of war, of every war, is the freedom of the press. And we have seen that now yeah. very clearly. We have seen that very clearly, the control of the military over the information. But OK, the war is over now. And I think there is a chance, at least a chance, I don't say a certainty, that the sufficient amount of information will be gathered, will be spread, the American people, Western European, the British people, Japanese people will be informed about what really happened and what is really happening there and that there will be a backlash, a positive backlash as it already started now with the business of the callous way in which the Kurdish uh, refugees are being treated. I mean, mm. there has been a reaction. People there are beginning to react at an react. empathetic human yeah, level yeah, to these yeah, uh, yeah. injustices. To these injustices, yeah. Well, it's a, it, it, we have a long way to go. There's yeah. such injustice Obviously. that is endemic in the world. Obviously. But Obviously. such a thing might be able to go, yeah. do you think it might be able to go to where there would be more of a generalized empathetic understanding? I think so. Because I think so. some people have said that this is the first, first world war directed against the third. There would have been civil wars, yeah. as it were, among the first world nations of Europe and Japan. It was uh, unfortunately Japan. not a world war. Yeah. It was, or fortunately, it was a, it was a very uneven uh, contest between a minor power. All this business about Saddam Hussein being a new Hitler is, is complete, is ridiculous. When one absurd. understands what Iraq is today in the world, mm. it was confronted by all the major industrial powers of the world. So yeah. that, that was not a real war against the third world. But okay, yeah. I mean that there is a trend to a greater oppression and repression of the third world and their people will react their people for instance in Europe just to give you one example not in the United States but in Europe there is a very big emotion it's a very big emotional reaction to the debt question mm -hmm. and the fact that the repayment of the, the third world debt means a flow of money of capital from the poorer countries to the rich countries, from the south to the north, yeah. this is looked upon as a scandal by a large part of the European population which reacts in a strong way to that. In the United States you don't have yet the same reaction, but I think uh, you have it in Europe already and this is an example that people are not totally callous. That's very, ha that's very heartening to hear that there is such a reaction oh, yes. because one wonders if you have a callousness uh, that was exhibited by the United States in, 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 in Iraq and if there is a united uh, Germany or united Europe, Japan, United States, first world and there were a callousness that was allowed to be exerted by the advantaged peoples of the world toward the disadvantaged peoples of the world uh, heaven help the disadvantaged peoples of the world who are having as difficult a time enough as it is now but you think there is a chance that this might there be is. able to help create an there empathetic is. understanding so. of those differences I think so the, the I think so I think so I'll just uh, give you two examples but I could give many um, uh, two books written by well-known authors 
One is a Frenchman, Gilles Perrault. The other one is an American, Susan George. Um, about problems of the third world, mm -hmm. have had a huge, a huge success in Europe. Have been sold, if I'm not mistaken, the figure around 300, 350,000 copies Marvelous, in a very yeah. short, very short time. Uh -huh. And it corresponds to a real popular feeling. It's not something which is uh, just a fluke. Uh -huh. uh, in several European countries, you have had big demonstrations against the uh, repayment of the debt. Um, Germany, I think you had, when the bankers met in Berlin, um, I don't remember the exact figure, 40,000, 50,000 people demonstrating in the streets. This summer we are going to have another bankers meeting in London, and uh, generally the people intent upon sponsoring or defending the cause of the most unprivileged in the world mm. uh, hope to have a very big demonstration there too. Now there I am moderately optimistic. It's nowhere what a real efficient political reaction yeah, yeah, should yeah. be. Or if this can come into consensus yeah. politics or have real effect. Of, it uh, has yeah. effects in certain countries, especially in France, where the Socialist Party, which is in power, has a very bad conscience on this question. Uh -huh. Very bad conscience. In Germany, the leader of the social democracy, who is the chairman of the Socialist International, Willy Brandt, has also a very, very deep feeling on this question, but he's not in power. Uh -huh. The French are in power, so they, they can do something and they try in their own way. I don't want to defend them. They played a very bad role during this war, uh -huh. but they want at least to differentiate themselves from uh -huh the extreme callous, callousness, if we can say yeah, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm not living in Europe. I'm not that familiar directly with Europe. Here in the United States, we've experienced uh, uh, since 1980, in a yeah, very real sense, a callousness I on know. the part of Mr. Reagan and on the part of Mr. Mr. Bush. Mr. Bush. You do think that perhaps the uh, the aftermath of this war, and as that begins could to change become real, a little bit. could be an impetus that might be able bit. to, in a meaningfully meaningful yeah. way in terms of consensus politics change the the, the empathetic understanding yeah. of the people little of bit. the United I don't States of the Western world yeah. that has become so callous? Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't exaggerate. I yeah. mean I'm no expert on American political life and I can speak with a certain confidence about Europe and a few other other countries in the world where where I know what's going on but in the United States I would be very cautious. But I think that I'm, it's strange that as a convinced Marxist I should say that you would think more of a, of a Christian to say a thing like that, but we feel very much, uh, we have very much in common with what I would call the progressive wing of the Catholic Church and of mm -hmm. the uh, Protestant Church on that issue. Um, today we have to believe otherwise there is no future yeah. for mankind yeah. and yeah. we there will be no world left and no human uh, yes, uh, humanity survive in the next 50 years yeah. we have to believe that there is a spark of consciousness a spark of as you say Decent empathy, yeah, empathy yeah. in practically every human being yeah. and we have to find the correct words the correct ways, the correct sensitivity to make that spark explode, uh -huh. appear. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And you can do that. You can do that. I'll just give an example of a completely different field. But I feel very, very strongly about it because this is a person to whom personally also I feel very, very strong. In the Amazon forest, there was a modest timber home of a wonderful person. By the way, in that modest timber home, there was a portrait of Leon Trotsky, to whose ideas I generally, with some restrictions, adhere. Mm -hmm. This friend, this person, Chico Mendes, founded the trade union of the rubber tappers in that forest. He founded the Labour Party, 
Workers' Party of Brazil section in that forest, which is a very powerful mass party, which has more than half a million members and got more than 10% of the popular vote in the last elections. Biggest socialist party which you have outside of Western Europe and Japan today in the world. Mm. And he was also uh, dedicated, I would say fanatically dedicated ecologist. He wanted to defend the tropical forest against the imposition by money interests who are cutting down this yeah, forest, yeah. which are the, lung, yep. the lungs right. of humankind today. Right. He was killed mm -hmm. by paid goons of these money interests. And then an amazing thing happened. The last survivor of the Beatles, McCarthy, made a song about Chico Mendes. This song has been literally reproduced on millions of copies throughout the world. Mm -hmm. One dead too many uh -huh. is called this song. This shows you yes, 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 that yes. you cannot destroy yeah. correct humanitarian, positive, progressive ideas even when you kill the people who express them in the first stage. That's why I am moderately optimistic. <laughs> Appropriate perhaps as, as uh, prostituted as perhaps and coerced and bribed as the UN has been over these last few months in the case of uh, the Persian Gulf, it might be appropriate that uh, in the memory of Chico Mendes that, uh, that, that, that the, the very large ecological conference is going to be held in Brazil yeah. in 1992 and let's hope that that's the, the kind of spark of change that might be able to be realized as you say it's a time when it's of absolutely essential existentially testing time of all that's of humanity right. and so let's hope that we can find a way I thank you for those optimistic words they're a little hard to find in these times uh, of difficulty it's been a, a bit of a, uh, of a nightmare that we've been going through more recently, at least, is certainly seen from the United States perspective of people that are concerned. I thank you very much for all of your work over the years, your contribution to understanding of, of uh, Marxist ideology and of uh, tending toward a more just and equitable world. Thank you for participating here in conversations very much indeed. Thank you. I would remind you in the cable television audience, it's been your pleasure to have the perceptions of Ernst Mandel in there from the, uh, was it the Free University again? Of Brussels. Brussels. Yeah. Of Brussels and uh, extraordinary uh, Marxist scholar and a uh, carrier of the flame as it were over a long and uh, distinguished career. We're pleased and honored to be able to have him here uh, on, this, on this segment of Conversations. We invite you to tune in again next week. We'll be coming back next week on Conversations. That's it for this, uh, this segment again, Mr. Mendel, very much. Thank you very, very much indeed. Good night. We'll see you next week. The Declaration of Human Rights, adopted by the United Nations 40 years ago, may not be a legally binding document. It is rather a promise made by all the members of the United Nations to the people of the world. We at Amnesty International believe that the governments who have adopted the Declaration have a moral responsibility to keep that promise. Write Amnesty International, Post Office Box 37137, Washington, D.C., 20013.